Hey everybody, Jen Hatmaker here, your host of the For the Love podcast. Welcome to the show. Ah, today y'all, today, today, today. Right now we're in a series called For the Love of Faith Shakers. We really were interested in talking to leaders leading spiritual conversations in untraditional places. Um, so, you know, we're not necessarily looking toward conversations being held under the steeples. We're looking for them in the margins. We're looking for them um, in different environments with different people around the table, um, seeing what it looks like out there in the world with legs. Right. Um, and so it's a real shift from how we've approached, um, the last two faith series that we've done, um, which were a little bit more on the nose. So the last 10 years, I mean, really the last five, especially have brought me personally into spaces with people who are truly committed to reclaiming, um, faith and curiosity for just like everyday people. Right. Um, it's taken a really long time to unwind the notion that in order to be spiritual, you had to be in church, right? That's where the spiritual people went. And that's, that was the home for, for faith. Um, and behavior was sort of the marker right? Um, which isn't just like some of the choices that you made, but of course, more like who you listen to, who you affiliate with, who you align yourself with, um, how you sh- deal with emotion, how you deal with suffering and sorrow. What does addiction look like in a real life? What does mental health look like in a real life? Um, what if you are, you don't identify as, um, as a, cisgendered person, right? What does sexuality look like? All of it, real life, like real life. Um, and so if you're anything like me, you've probably been hearing some different voices that have maybe freed you up to pursue faith on your own terms. Um, just a, a true spiritual relationship with God that goes well beyond whatever very small window, perhaps we were originally allowed to view him in. God, I'm so grateful for the people that have been doing this for the long haul. So grateful for the voices who went ahead of me personally, um, saying resoundingly, your faith doesn't look like it used to. And that is okay. That, that is not faithlessness. That is called growth. That is called evolution. That is called maturity. I mean, what, what a liberating way to live. I, I, I will never, I owe such a debt of gratitude to the people who have gone before me, who held open the door on ideas that I had internal cognitive dissonance around, but did not know what to do with. Um, Because in my, in my sort of original structures, those questions were not welcomed. Um, Not only were they not welcomed, they were punished. And so I didn't know if we could push back. I didn't know if we could press hard on forms. Um, I didn't know what to do with these categories where my brain and my heart were out of alignment right? Where I heard, I'd heard things a certain way, but my spirit is saying, this doesn't feel true. This doesn't feel good. There is no life in this. There is death in this idea or in this doctrine or in this space. And so though the people who were, were a few steps ahead of me on the road, right. And holding those conversations, um, open for the rest of us to pull up a seat and listen and learn. I, I, I owe them everything. Really, I owe them everything. So our guest this week, you guys, man, man, man. Okay. She's one of the long haulers on a quiet little show. That's sarcasm. um, That speaks volumes about faith. It's on NPR and it's called On Being. (laughs) She's been inviting people from all faiths and perspectives um, to her open forum to tackle all those faith intersections where it meets with culture and personal growth. And, you know, if you like me have been on an ongoing journey to rediscover what your faith means to you and how, not just what it means to you, but how it acts, how does it act? How does it act in your own life? How do you live inside of it? What does it look like on the ground? Like today in this moment where you live, it's just so valuable. Oh, you guys, ugh, we're so honored to have Krista Tippett on the show today. <laughs> oh man, y'all, this conversation is so good. She's so spectacular. 
Oh, so that quiet little show I mentioned that Chris has been helming started all the way back in 2003. It's now on 400 radio stations and the podcast has over 300 million listens. And the On Being Project is a movement, literally. Um, So as an early faith shaker herself, Krista kind of saw the need in mainstream spaces to have these candid conversations around faith, like uh, about the religious and spiritual and moral and actual aspects of our everyday lives as humans. Um, So ever since Krista intuited that need and started the conversation, y'all, I don't even, she's gone on to become a New York Times bestselling author, obviously, a national humanities medalist, a Peabody award-winning broadcaster. Her show has been a forum for open spiritual inquiry and how that fits into social healing and science and culture. Um, and we're going to talk about how that show um, came to came to be and came to grow. And in her mission, she's seeking, she says, to uncover these questions. What does it mean to be human? How do we want to live? And who will we be to each other? And that simple premise has gotten a lot of people listening and is having an influence far greater than probably she could have ever imagined when she started. In fact, in 2014, Krista was awarded the National Humanities Medal by Barack Obama, who said, Miss Tippett avoids easy answers, embracing complexity and inviting people of every background to join her conversation about faith, ethics, and moral wisdom. Praise. She's worth every bit of her salt. She is smart. She is so elegant. She's thoughtful. She's tender, intelligent. I've been such a fan and admirer of hers for so long that I kind of had to take deep cleansing breaths before she came on today Um, and sort of settle into the pocket with her because she has meant so much to me. She's been a mentor to me from afar, not just as a host, um, but as a human. Um, as a human who's, in my opinion, asking the better questions. So I could not be more delighted. I really couldn't. You're going to love this conversation. I'm so glad you hit download. Please enjoy my conversation with the irreplaceable Krista Tippett. Well, gosh. Okay. (laughs) Krista. Krista Tippett, welcome to the show. I'm so happy to meet you. I am happy to be here with you. Oh, you're just, you have, um, really done groundbreaking and pioneering work in this space. And I've been paying attention to you for years and years and years and learning from you and not just in this genre, but just in life as a human person who prioritizes, um, curiosity and connection and meaning and, um, you're, you have built a body of work that is so wildly, um, impressive and it's meant so much to so many millions of people. And so it's really an honor to have you here today. Genuinely. Thank you. Mm-hmm. So, okay. I've told my listeners a little bit about you, the few that don't know you. Um, so I definitely want to hear the story from you about how on being began, but before we get to that, I would love to turn um, what I hear is one of your favorite interview questions back on you, which is, let's start here. What is your religious and spiritual background going like back to your childhood? I, I would love to hear how was faith presented and modeled to you by your family or people of influence in your life back then? And then kind of rounding it out, what was your understanding of your own relationship with God? Mm -hmm. That's good. That adding the, my understanding of my relationship with God is, um, I can't, you know, I don't always, I, I I think, especially because I started my show on public radio, I couldn't actually use that language. Um, Hmm. so one of the things that's interesting about this question, and I think this is true for all of us is that, um, you would answer it differently in in any given month, in any given year. Mm. Uh, I mean, the facts are that I grew up um, Southern Baptist, you know, going to church three times a week. Church was immersive. Church was not just church. Church was social life. It was community. It was, it was Wednesday night supper. It was, of course. Um, It was, you know, um, 
it was where I was constantly told uh, not to have sex. And as a result, That's we right. were always talking about sex. Right? Always obsessed, <laughs> obsessed. <laughs> yes. Um, but I think, you know, m- my grandfather was a Southern Baptist preacher. He was mm-hmm. an evangelist. He, 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 he had a church at different times, but he was also somebody who kind of went around to small country churches and, um, preached the gospel and mowed the lawn and Mm. right. And did it all. And he had a huge heart and he was Mm. passionate. I mean, I knew that he was passionate and yet his preaching was all about the dangers of passion. Um, Mm. You know, right. And in some ways he was, he was the most fun adult in, of all the adults in my life. Mm. Um, That's interesting. Yeah. But when he was in the pulpit, you know, he was so stern Mm. and he was incredibly loving. And when he talked about heaven, it was so Mm. small. (laughs) It was like all about. So small. And so, but here's the thing. I think my, my grandfather had incredible integrity and, you know, he Mm. had a great education and he, I, I feel, and he had a great big mind, like he was really, mm. really intelligent. And I think I knew that. And I, but he'd never been invited to apply his mind or his questions mm. to the Bible, which he loved. And I, I think even as a child, this, there was this, um, I was aware of, of all of these contradictions, but I think that I took all of the contradictions. I think all of those contradictions came into my sense of God. And I think above all, I internalized how he lived rather than how he spoke. So Mm. I did have a sense of a love Mm. universe. Um, I did have a sense um, that, that, that of like really enjoying my grandfather's mind. And I, I sometimes feel like, um, when I started the show, I sometimes feel like I'm asking the questions he, he didn't think he could ask. Mm. I, I feel like he's kind of over yeah. my shoulder at times. Mm. Yeah. And I like to think about how he, it's just, I know, you know, this, cause you're part of this too. We live in this time when faith is evolving and our traditions are evolving and our experience of this is evolving. We are evolving. And I do like to think about how my grandfather you know, might've been in this. Yeah. Yeah. I love that. I love that posture toward what might've been possible for him, you know, if he was here now and had continued to evolve and change. And I mean, I can even take that down one generation and look at my own parents. I also grew up Southern Baptist exactly like you. I, my dad was on staff. My, he went to seminary when I was three. And so from that point on, we were staffers. And I mean, I knew that Wednesday night men, you like the back of my hands. Yeah. Um, and all the youth group things, everything that you said is my same experience. But even when I look at my own parents, um, who are in their seventies, their evolution is So, I I mean, if you would have told 20 year old Jen, these are going to be some questions your parents ask, um, in, you know, 30 years, I I just would have been stunned. And it is, I love that generous posture toward, um, generation to generation. We kind of do the best we can with what we know. Um, we ask as many questions as we feel like we're allowed to. And, and who knows? what's going to, what's coming behind us, like what they're going to be willing to press on and ask. I've got five kids and they are, they're 16 to 23 and they're already asking things that never even occurred to me. Like they're already there and they're barely out of adolescence. Um, and so I, I feel if once upon a time, cause as you know, Krista in our world, certainty was rewarded. Yes. You know, that was our currency, um, where curiosity was, was punished more yeah. or less. Um, it was scary, it, right? It I was scary. It was, yeah. Did you feel scared? I'm curious if you felt scared when you began to ask your own personal questions, because I remember feeling like some sort of internal breach, like, am I 
am I being unfaithful? Like, is it okay that I am asking hard questions of this faith that raised me? right? Of the, the people that mentored me and their positions on the world and on the Bible and on theology. And I just remember having, my, at some point, I was my own worst enemy. I think that I was really aware of how terrified the adults were. Ah, oh, interesting. But, right. Mm. So I think I was tuned into that, but, you know, I grew up in a house without a lot of books without a lot of, mm. I mean, the Bible was our book. And yeah. I actually found in the Bible, reading it for myself directly, that it completely honored the questions and mm. it honored the anguish. And it, mm. it, it, it was full of things that didn't make sense or were contradictory. And, and I think for me, that was an opening to not mm. feel that that I couldn't hold, um, you know, that faith had to be in opposition to what didn't make sense or was contradictory. Mm. That is amazing that you were able to secure that generous reading of scripture (laughs) when you weren't necessarily in a home that also honored the questions. That was a deep sense of spiritual maturity like in your own heart and mind, which I can, of course, now see parsed out in your life, uh, that this was probably deeply seated in you from the beginning to be who you are in the world. Um, So I definitely want to get, and we're going to get to your own understanding of God and how that has evolved over the years. But if you would, I'd love to first start with um, how you began with on being. Um, just arguably it's, it's kind of, it occupies its own zip code genuinely, Krista, like <laughs> you don't really have a, it, there's not really an equal to it. There isn't, it's kind of in its own galaxy that you, you chart, you set out and charted a new path. And then a bunch of us came behind you in our own different ways, um, in our own voice and in our own spaces, but kind of following in your footsteps. Um, so, you know, like most shows that might be considered religious. Um, you were relegated to the less than desirable Sunday morning hour at the beginning, which I'd love to hear you talk about. Um, and I, from the beginning, you're different than the classic Sunday morning, like churchy religious shows for sure. Like you were never in lockstep with your sort of ancillary shows next to you. So, um, I'm curious, how did that differentiation start to get noticed by listeners as you were you, and you began to open yourself up to conversations about faith and culture through this particular medium. And, um, and then I'd love to hear like, when was the moment, if there was one, when you noticed that others were listening, engaging, and maybe saying, Mm, this is different. This is a different, this she's building a different space, um, a different set of listeners perhaps are welcomed here that may not be elsewhere. Um, and that people seeking out a certain version of their faith were tuning in. I just love to hear the origin story and then how it sort of like captured the imagination of your listening community. Well, so I'm going to be really honest with you and say that I was such a guerrilla warrior, or I experienced myself to be such a fighter for so many years. Hmm. And um, now remember, this is pre-podcasting, right? You had to have, um, there were gatekeepers to having your voice out there. And, um, but what I want to say to you is that um, even at this stage where I've, you know, I've been doing this for 20 years and I kind of started um, pitching it and piloting it with varying degrees of success, Um, Hmm. I mean, but not with success, like really, you know, I was able to like turn up at the radio station late at night after I put my kids to bed, but nobody was seeing me. And um, yes. But to this day, you know, I don't expect Jen Hatmaker to, to be listening to On Being or to mm. say the things you say. I mm. still feel <laughs> like this is an underdog enterprise, which I need to get over. It um, is not. It I, is not. But it's just, it's true. And, um, and, you know, so yes, there was no podcasting. Um, mm. It wasn't, 
You know, I love, I felt like public radio was a special space in okay. public radio has changed also in these years. Um, but it was, so what felt important to me is that I, I wanted, I was, I had been a journalist. I yes. had gone to seminary. Yeah. I had come out in the late nineties when, and then was kind of, you know, try like just, you know, walking around with this idea, trying to get people to take it seriously. It mm -hmm. was a time of the moral majority of Christian coalition. Mm -hmm. yep. And then we kind of cross the, you know, we, we move into the 21st century. We have an evangelical president in the white house. It's nine 11. So there's all mm -hmm. this religiosity in the news, often very politicized, often mm -hmm. extreme, not actually representing the way most people are are experiencing this part of their lives, even if they're mm. devoutly religious. Um, and I, I wanted to, uh, but I, and so I was, I, I felt like we, there has to be a way to represent the complexity of this and also the centrality of it. And the fact that it's as much about questions, maybe more about questions than it is about answers. Mm. Um, and there's so much, I don't even want to use the word diversity, which is too small a word, right? Like the array of how human, how we walk around with this, what it means in our lives mm -hmm. and the ways we practice and the vocabulary we have and the different ways we pray. Um, um, and I wanted to, I wanted to open a space. I also found that whenever religion was discussed in public, certainly in the news mm -hmm. um, and, and on public radio. Yes. It, it was, it, it, it had the effect of shutting people's imaginations down. Mm -hmm. And I wanted to show that you could talk about this and we could speak about the part of ourselves mm -hmm. that we mean when we, when we use language of religious or spiritual mm -hmm. and, and we could do that with all the complexity and intelligence and the different kinds yes. of intelligence intelligence, right? That we are applying and delving into in this part of ourselves um, mm -hmm. and how it really works in lives and not in the news That's and good. also not in really sectarian settings that tended to kind of set the public imagination about this. Mm -hmm. um, so that was, that was what I hoped to do um, in the beginning when I was walking around and I thought like, so the other thing about public radio is I knew that I could have, you know, I could, I could do something in depth. I could have an hour right now. You can mm. start a podcast and you can have three uh -huh. hours, yes. but this is not possible then. Um, and, um, so I, yeah, I, I, I wanted to, um, I, I understood when I started talking about this, that people didn't think it was possible because there weren't, I couldn't point at other places and say, this is, this is what it looks like. This is what it sounds like. So people said, this will be proselytizing. This will be exclusionary. Mm. Mm. People will get offended. Uh, people, you know, it will be inflammatory. It will make people angry. Mm. Um, it will be moralizing. And I know, and you know, that, how so many of us live this part of our lives is none of those things, but yeah. we kind of, we had to demonstrate it. Right. So I would get yeah. found a couple of people, you know, who got it, who said, let's yeah. try this, let's risk it. Yeah. And it went from there. Like I hear you talk about that now and that level of intelligent dialogue kind of couched in human dignity has found a much stronger foothold kind of in the center of a lot of spaces. Um, certainly not all let's, let's be clear that, you know, we, we, uh, we largely see a, a different version of this um, in the public sphere, but at the time, like when you, when this was your vision, yeah. this was different. It was <laughs> like you were, you had a vision for something that, we just weren't seeing that often. And I can only imagine that the reaction to your um, sort of dream for the space you were building was mixed. Um, now I'm projecting, <laughs> I'm projecting. Hostile. It was mostly hostile. Did you ever feel like 
thrown in the towel? Was there a moment at the beginning where it was hard? It was pushing uphill so hard to, to create what you wanted that you thought this, this isn't going to work, or I'm going to have to reverse, or I'm going to have to find another place or way to do this. Oh yeah, absolutely. I I remember very clearly, um, my 40th birthday. So I guess, so I was born in 1960 and I had started actually in like 1999, I started, um, so November, 1960. So, so, so kind of through 99 and 2000, I was kind of carrying around this idea and begging and pleading and doing these little local pilots. Um, Mm. and I kept being given producers who were nice people, but they really didn't get it. And they were so worried about the effect that it would have that I couldn't work them to be really creative and, and, um, you know, expansive and bold. And I I do remember on my 40th birthday, which is a little over a year in, I, I was just, I knew that day, Mm. I knew that it was not going to work, um, that I wasn't going to be able to carry it all the way through to what I had hoped it might be Mm. the decision I made that day. Um, I had some poetry of Rilke with me and the decision I made that day was um, that even though it wasn't going to work, um, it was worth, it had been worth trying and I was going to kind of, you know, walk as far as I could um, with my integrity and kind of honoring the vision and the reasons that I'd hoped to do it. And um, yeah, maybe you could say that was a, that was a a leap of faith moment. And so all it did was I just kept going. I just kept walking. Yes. Yeah. Yes. And you did that long enough and in, in alignment, in integrity, without compromising your posture, your capacity to peel back layers of really every sort of face structure. So you didn't, um, you didn't hold back. You didn't, you didn't prioritize some spaces who, that weren't up for re-examination and, you know, protect others or you kind of went all in, um, at, which was bold and uh, honestly courageous at the time, because anytime you began to just gently press on forms and structures that a group of people hold dear and not that not just that they hold dear, that they 100% consider to be right. Yeah. Um, This is the right way. We have found it. Us, me and us, me and our people, we have found the thing that that small bullseye um, of rightness inside a faith structure. Um, You're just going, you're just basically constantly inviting critique and criticism Um, and people's own fears you know, which were easily projected toward you, the question asker, the, the form pusher, um, when you would say, this is maybe what religious zealotry gone amok looks like, or this particular space or doctrine or idea, um, is, is, has harm and baked into it. This is, this is harmful for humanity, or, um, this requires a second look. Um, and so I'm curious, and you have so much to pull from. I mean, I can't imagine assessing 20 years of leadership in this space, but if you had to just maybe pick one or two, what were some of the areas, whatever that looks like, it could be an idea. It could be a, a, a subculture, um, a, a denomination. I'm not sure what you, you tell me, but what, what were a couple of the areas where you open them up for evaluation or examination that created the most giant blowback to you where you just like, whoa, I mean, like I have to be serious to pick this one up again. Like this is a tough one. This is a tough crowd. You know, um, the experience I had is that there were people who didn't get it and weren't curious Mm. and weren't going to listen. Uh Um, and so it really didn't matter what we did. That's true. Right. Mm-hmm. But I did also keep having the experience that 
you know, people had certain ideas about how deeply religious people would sound mm -hmm. and what they would say, or they had ideas about subjects that would never be part of a show about religion, like physics, you know, sure. like scientists. Sure. And I, you know, what I actually found, I, I really do believe that, um, that the sensibility, that the intentionality with which something is offered shapes uh, the reaction that comes at it. And hmm. what I think I found, like I was beleaguered in my institution. I was beleaguered by, um, as you say, people who thought they knew how this should be done and it was never going to look like me or sound like me or be about the subject. Hmm. But I kept having the experience that people would say, um, you know, like when we started putting a lot of scientists on the show um, and we weren't talking, you know, some of these scientists were themselves religious people and some of them weren't. But sure. what I was so fascinated by is that they were asking, they in their own way were pursuing these questions of what it means to be human and how to mm -hmm. live and who we are to each other. They yes. were forming and enriching um, the way those questions get answered um, in theology or yes. in spiritual practice. They belonged as a companion to them. That's right. And so what I found more, it was either there were the people who just weren't going to listen and they, there would be blowback for anything, but there were a lot of people who said, who, who, who just softened, right? Who, who would just, it would be more, you know, I hadn't realized you could do this. Yes. And um, it would be a lovely kind of surprise mm. that that softened um, into curiosity and mm. into wanting to hear more. Yes. Uh, so rewarding, mm. you know, when when you get to see that happen over and over inside your listening community, um, people softening to consider their faith in new ways, consider new perspectives, imagining the, the level of input that feeds the conversation, even if not from a traditionally, a traditional faith source um, is wonderful. This is so wonderful for the, a collective faith culture to have this posture toward life and one another and, and God and our sense of um, humanity on this earth. I, I'm, I love that. And I love that you hung on to it. Um, you could have, you could have shifted even in small degrees. You could have, you could have made it a little bit more palatable for a smaller community. And you know, the rules you grew up in them, you know, the language, um, it's probably your first, it's your native tongue. Like it is mine. <laughs> you know, I know that I know how to do that. Yes. I know how to speak that. Yeah. Um, and, and you're rewarded inside of those structures. And so the fact that you really, um, you hung on to that is so admirable, Krista, and has created so many powerful and fascinating conversations in your world. If you follow me on Facebook or Instagram, you know that I'm literally always wearing Able. I've believed in this brand from day one. I will forever champion a fashion company that's not only devoted to chic, effortless style, but that also empowers women through opportunity and dignity. So I was thrilled to take my love of Able to the next level this spring and collaborate on a collection of dresses with sleeves and with pockets. Hello. As you might know, we love dresses with sleeves around here, and we also love dresses with pockets, and we especially love ones that are size inclusive and versatile enough to be worn a million ways for any occasion. You guys, it has been so fun to see this collab come to life. Plus, Abel has so many other amazing new apparel items, sandals, sneakers, handbags, jewelry, perfect for spring and summer. And how incredible that dressing the part with Abel is also doing so much good in our world. Head on over to ableclothing.com to check out my dress collection and all their amazing new arrivals. And then use my code Jen to save 15% off anything. So that's ableclothing.com and use the code Jen.
I've talked a lot about mental health. You know this. But did you know that reading can be super supportive of your mental wellness too? Um, like if you've ever gotten lost in a good book, then you know how much of a transporting experience reading can be. But reading has also been proven to reduce stress and anxiety, to increase empathy and social support, and promote respect for and tolerance of other views. So let me tell you about the magical place we've created with the Jen Hatmaker Book Club. It's full of stories. The ones we read, of course, and the ones we share among our private community, which is the single best corner of the internet, truly. So every month, a beautiful box is magically delivered to your door and inside is an adventure waiting for you. And I know I sound like the biggest nerd here, but this book club truly has been such a radically good thing for me and the women in our community. And I'll tell you this, they are waiting to welcome you with open arms. We always get to hear from the authors themselves every month. They give us their favorite music playlists and more. And you always have an opportunity to ask them directly your pressing questions about their book. This book club is truly one of my favorite things. Come join us. It's at jenhatmakerbookclub.com. I'm curious, again, this is too big of a question. It feels unfair to ask you this, but after 20 years, right, of sitting across from some of the smartest, most interesting people on earth, do you have a couple of highlights where you just thought, this is why I do what I do? This is, this exceeded my expectations. Maybe the response to a, a certain guest was overwhelming or, um, surprised you in some way. I'd love to hear, I mean, it's, it's a tall order because at this point yeah. you've spoken to everybody, but <laughs> personal um, favorites. Well, yeah. And it's hard. I'm also just somebody who, if you ask me, what's my favorite movie, I will not be able to think of a single movie I've ever seen. Uh, I know. Oh, yeah. I know. I know. When people ask me, what's your favorite book? I'm like, I don't think I've ever read a book. I can't think of I've one. I can't think of ever yeah. a, a single book yeah. I've ever read in my life. Yeah. And so I often have felt like my favorite interview is the last one I did. <laughs> Same. I love, you know, I like kind of, I kind of, you know, do this Vulcan mind meld with yes I'm going to interview and I'm I'm just so steeped in who they are and how yes they, me too how they live and I love them mm -hmm. and um but I you know recently yeah there are a few that come to mind I mean mm. I think it's important for me to say that um before I give this answer mm. so it's always really important to me not um to be interviewing famous people all the time right not yes. to be, not to be interviewing the spiritual gurus. Um, yep. and I, you know, I have gone very light on spiritual authorities just as I've gone mm. light on politicians because <laughs> spiritual authorities are a form of politician and That's I'm right. just not interested in people who have, I mean, I'm ha you know, we need them, but I'm not from uh -huh. my perspective. Is I don't want to draw people out who have all the answers and want to draw yes. people out who are just as at home in their questions. That's good. So, and, um, so, so I've interviewed a lot of people across the years and those are just, you know, who, who are, who are not like, you know, let's say somebody like Walter Brueggemann, hmm. who, the prophet of, of the, the theologian of the, of the Hebrew prophets, who is hmm. not a household name by any means, but anybody who's ever gone to seminary has read him. Of course. Right. Or, or interviewing people in other fields who are like, we, we all know that whatever our field is, whatever our community is, there are these mm. giants who are shaping lives. That's right. And they're not, they, 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 you know, most of the wise people in the world are not famous. So, so having said that, <laughs> I am thinking when you asked me that question of um, people I sat with, you know, recently Thich Nhat Hanh died and Desmond Tutu died. Yes. Um, uh, um, you know, Desmond Tutu is somebody I wanted to interview for years and years. And, you know, we tried to get the interview and it never happened. Sure. And then he was on retreat. He was on a spiritual retreat. And I sat with him at that spiritual mm. retreat. And, um, yeah, I felt I, there, there are some people and he, he was just absolutely this who, 
he had all the qualities. I mean, it's kind of bringing me back to my grandfather, right? He mm. was a huge personality. Yes. He knew how to be fierce, right? This man mm. had been, had seen the darkest, you know, the, the darkest, most uh, hateful capacities mm. of humanity. Um, and he had, um, and he had faced that and he had met it. He was pragmatic and he was so loving, right? And he mm. was so joyful. And part of how he lived through all of that and shifted the world was that he never stopped knowing how to laugh, yes. to, to stand before beauty and wonder. Mm. You know, he talked about the God he believed in as a God of surprises. And yes. he told me that God has a sense of humor. And the thing mm. about if you hear something from Desmond Tutu about God, you know, you just believe him. So, I believe it right now. You just said it. I'm like, well, that's true. That's it. So now we know that that's true. Yes. <laughs> you know, yes. Um, I think another person, um, and this is why I said the thing about everybody not being famous, because I'm sure got big names, but, but these are also people I sat with. Mary yes. Oliver, the poet. Um, oh, of course. Oh what, gosh. What I want to say about Mary Oliver, I mean, mm. it's not, um, you know, she's not a religious, she was not a religious or spiritual figure, but she was right. Yes. She I know exactly what you mean. The world experiencing the sacred mm. and turning that into poetry and giving other people an experience of it. But I want to tell you what I loved about being with her as much as okay. that was that she chain smoked through the entire. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> one just you know one gift of beauty mm. and wisdom um after the other yeah <laughs> she took another it's the best just the best she, and she was wearing her um new england patriot sweatshirt <laughs> of course yes <laughs> and because you know mary oliver is somebody who one always imagined her which was also true of her like you know, she went walking every day in the woods mm -hmm. and she took her notebook and she carried her notebook in front yes. of her. And we imagined her being this um, mm. kind of a saintly figure. I do love the incarnational emphasis of Christianity. And yes. Fully incarnate with all the mess that mm. that, that entails um, and all the beauty and all the possibility. Yeah. So those are, those are some that, that come to mind right away. Two amazing examples two precious human people you're so lucky to have sat across from and get to bear witness to the way that they lived in the world and um lived perceived yeah i mean just incredible absolutely incredible i krista we started kind of the show i was asking you about your formative faith kind of your origin story of faith i'd love to know because my gosh the, uh, the change that you have seen in the zeitgeist in 20 years is profound yeah. um, uh, in, in every sector, really, but certainly around faith, um, uh, organized religion. What does it look like in culture? How this next generation is coming up very different from the one before them, you've just, you've seen it, you've watched it in real time and hosted probably a lot of really formative questions around those changes. And so um, I have two questions around that. I'd love to just hear your take on on the, the and there's a, there's a million ways to answer this, but some of the primary things that you have seen shift and change inside faith spaces in general, uh, maybe what it looks like, particularly in sort of Western, the Western version iteration of faith. Um, and then secondly, I'd love to hear you talk about your personal faith mm -hmm. and how that has also evolved right alongside um, probably parallel to many conversations that you've had over the same amount of time and where you kind of find yourself today. Yeah. Well, that's big. Yes, I um, know. <laughs> just those two small things. Just, okay. just those. Yes. Um, it's been a fascinating uh, span of decades to yes to be asking these questions, to be following this part of the human enterprise. You know what I've seen all this time and 
it's just fully on display now is that so many of the forms of all of our disciplines that came out of the 20th century, like, you know, we can talk about anything, how we, how we do school, how we do yes. medicine, how we do yeah. law, how we do politics, and how we do church, right? How we've done yeah. religion. Um, they don't make sense for who we're becoming and what we're learning and how we live and the way our technologies have upended things. So, you know, I, uh, you may know this about my history. I spent time in divided Berlin when I was in my twenties, yes. which is really yeah. formative for me. And um, the theologian Dietrich Bonhoeffer, who um, died in a Nazi prison, um, yes. he, uh, he had this phrase, so in his lifetime, in his context, he saw Christianity be completely co-opted and distorted by, um, by a terrible ideology, by a government. And he talked about um, what he called religionless Christianity that was rising up. Yeah. And for him, that meant the question of if the institution is ruined by the culture, um, mm which again was a really different, a different kind of ruining than we have, but I, mm. it feels very resonant to me. If the institution yeah. is ruined by the culture, um, what is it that remains? Like what mm. is it that is true mm. and that will absolutely transcend even the complete death of which for him was true of the institution? Mm. Um, what will still be alive in the world? And I feel like that's a way to describe what I've seen. Um, because the institution, for different reasons, sometimes because the institutions have really failed, have failed to be what they what they arose to do. Yes. There's been, you know, we 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 know this. There's people have been devastated, but but a lot of it also is just the forms don't make any sense. It's not in the Bible that church is at 10 o'clock on Sunday morning, right? That's right. <laughs> um, that's right. Uh, and I think that the pandemic has, um, yeah. you know, it was already going to have to be remade. And I think that's just been accelerated. Mm. Um, but what I have seen, you know, I think in the 80s and 90s, um, it was the beginning of the kind of new age of, um, of this kind of smorgasbord. A theologian I really love talked about um, spiritual promiscuity. <laughs> just, mm. Uh -huh, I like it. I'll tell you a little bit of that. Uh -huh. but what I've seen in my lifetime, I see the spiritual searching, a lot of the spiritual searching now, and the way young generations are coming about this has having an incredible amount of depth to it. Yes. Real substance, real integrity. That's right. And to the extent that they are criticizing the institutions, they're saying, you know, I remember a young man saying to me, like, we're saying church, act like a church, right? That's good. <laughs> And they, mm. um, I'm fascinated. So I feel like they really are saying like, what is the heart of this? What is the yeah. core of this? They are, they are rediscovering. As one thing that's interesting is I think people my age um, often, um, you know, had a lot of baggage. And a lot of young people now have been raised by parents who had a lot of baggage and they didn't want to pass that baggage on. So they have given them no formation at all. What's mm -hmm. interesting about new generations arising who've had no formation at all is that um, they also have no baggage. They're not rejecting anything. They have questions. Yes. They have a pure and searing mm -hmm. curiosity. Mm -hmm. They have spiritual lives and they want to give form to that. They are you know, I want, I want to rediscovering isn't the right word, but they are like, you know, they want to be of service. They want their lives to be of service. Yeah. They want to be in community. They understand their yeah. need of ritual. Um, and in that they are kind of re recreating, um, building out, I think those core elements that survive, mm -hmm. um, as for me, you know, the question of my, um, I don't know, I just, well, you know, I've, I've had so many chapters of my life at this point. Sure. I, mean, I think about my kids are, my kids are all grown now, both of them. <laughs> grown. Um, but I think, um, 
you know, those active parenting years, so much of spiritual practice is in that daily yes. interaction. And you never know what you're doing, right? Like you don't. <laughs> that's the gig is up. Like we didn't understand that. I thought my parents knew everything because they were parents. <laughs> and then you get there and go, is this the deal? Is right. this how everybody is? Like yeah. we're all just playing at it. You know, pretending and yeah, like one long uh, experiment in humility. Yes. And, you know, my like personal disciplines have, um, have changed a lot. And I don't really think of that as finding the right one. I feel like I go mm. through, different. you know, there was a time yeah, too. I read Compline every night from the, from the Anglican prayer book and thought I would always do that. And and there's been a, you know, I've gone, I, I do a lot of what I call like contemplative reading and Mary Oliver's poetry or yeah. wins when things fall apart um, or John O'Donohue's books. Um, sure. I have been in and out of having a religious community. Hmm. Um, okay. I think that right now I, you know, I don't have that. I think the biggest I think the biggest way I would talk about the evolution of my, I'm, I think as I get older, this is interesting. You know, you talked a minute ago about the language we speak. I think yeah. I become clearer again that I do have a spiritual homeland. I do have a spiritual mother tongue and that matters. Mm -hmm. And um, I, I think that when it growing up with my grandfather, and as you said, growing up in that world of where we were always needing, looking, hoping for certainty, mm -hmm. um, I actually think uh, there was not much space for mystery in that relationship right. with my childhood. For sure. There were certain kinds of mystery, but they were contained and they were held within the community. Yes. And I, I have developed this absolute delight in mystery. And I also believe that mystery is orthodoxy, right? Like mm, at the orthodox of Christianity, mm. of Judaism, of Islam, even these big monotheistic yeah. traditions, we are told that there are things we will not understand in this lifetime. And standing before that with reverence and with humility is part of being devout. And so for me, all of this works together now. It all holds together. Um, and it feels like an adventure. And I just get more and more comfortable um, with that adventure not having a lot of uh, <laughs> very defined edges. Faith. Yes. Yeah, yeah. The edges are soft. Yeah. And it's a lovely faith. I find myself in the same place. Um, I have said basically one way or another that um, the older I get, the less I know genuinely. I am less certain of things year by year. If something yeah. falls away, there will be something <laughs> next year that I thought I kind of had a the lead on this that I'm going to go, oh no, you know what? I'm not sure. I, I, I put that in a different category now. And, and so what remains is so lovely and pure and true. And for the rest of it to be mysterious, to be holy in its own way that I don't can't necessarily define or quantify is so beautiful. It's a beautiful faith. And I find a comfort in it once upon a time. I don't know if you felt this way, but when I was younger, um, in the structures that I was raised in, certainty was a comfort that made me feel safe. It was a safety net. Like, at least I'm getting this right. And if I can just hold to the tenets and do the things and do the steps and not have sex, of course. Um, Which it all came back to somehow. Yeah, I mean, it's somehow it all, all roads point to sex. Um, yeah. I, I will be secure. I will be a secure. And But, you know, that safety began to unravel with maturity and even just exposure as, as you are just exposed to the rest of the world and new perspectives and different ideas and different kinds of thinkers and the, the vast array of ideas in the world. Um, and so now I'm opposite. I cherish mystery and, um, prioritize it. And I, actually I, anytime I have an idea that I'm workshopping, and I feel super, super sure about it. I'm suspect. 
I'm like, Jen, let's, let's, let's make sure you're seeing this from every angle. Um, and so I appreciate so much that that's your posture in the world and that you've held room for that all this time. Um, and what you've created, uh, liberation for so many people, you've given them a sort of permission to ask, to push, to pull, um, to surrender, to stay open and interested. And that matters. That is a big deal. And that is good work in the world. It's a new year, beloveds. We made it to 2022. This is a time where some of us may set resolutions or maybe intentions or words for our year. It's a great time to really reflect on where we need to just pull some different levers in our lives. This is why I'm also just so excited to introduce you to the Me Course series, which is a series that I have put out with my incredible team. Our mission here is simple. This is inspirational, educational, and actionable content, as I like to say, for the rest of us. It's not heady graduate level work here, okay? But it is what we all need, from finance, to building better habits, to cultivating simplicity in the name of wellness, and more. These are some of the pillars where I personally have seen the most life change in myself and in others. And so with me, course, we are telling you what actually does work. And I do it with some friends, friends who are experts in their respective fields, and they talk you through it too. We've really distilled it all down to the best of the best, a true highlight reel of everything you need to know in real life and how to make it work for you without you needing to commit hours upon hours of your time, which you don't have. Here's what you can expect. Four 15-ish minute sessions, and that's it. But also, as you will see, that is enough. We They are packed and condensed without tons of fluff. We also have a whole library of bonus resources to explore and implement and remind you of what you learned. You get it all. Let's start learning together and be here for our lives in this way. So register now at mecourse.org and use the code for the love to save $10 off already discounted prices. This is the best deal. I can't wait. Mecourse.org. Join us. I want to wrap this up with you, Krista. Um, this whole series on my show is about faith shakers. And so we were really curious to talk to leaders who were hosting spiritual conversations in non-traditional spaces. So kind of like you mentioned earlier, we don't have any pastors in this series. We don't have sort of the, the traditional spiritual authorities in this series, the ministry leaders. We were looking for people in different places, on the margins in some cases, um, just elsewhere. For you, knowing that we consider you a very profound faith shaker, um, what would you say, just off the top of your head maybe, is the biggest shakeup that you have had in your own personal faith journey? If you could, of course, at this stage, there's a million. There's a million things that kind of rock you off your perch. Uh, but if you pointed to one to say, this was a kind of a before and after moment for me, faith-wise. Um, so it's really hard for me to, and I, I know this makes sense to you, to separate like my faith life from my life life, right? I like this. Yes. Um, so I think um, it would be um, a really serious depression I had in my <laughs> mid to late thirties. Yes. Um, I'd gone to seminary. I would started having, I had my, my, I'd become a mother. Um, all of that was good. Um, and you know, and depression is so, it's so hard to describe, although so many people have been through it now it's, it's, you know, it's not just not, it's, it's not just not no, you know, not having a sense of hope or joy or what those might look like in the future. It's like not being able to imagine how that ever felt or what that could, that that could possibly ever happen again. Um, every, you know, the bottom fell out of my understanding, all, all these things I had told myself about my 
family and the yes. love that I knew growing up. I had to get honest um, about who I was and how um, how I'd survived and how hard my survival techniques had been on me. Mm. And I still, I still, you know, I'm going to work with that all my days. Yeah. But I, so it's like, you know, faith in everything disappearing. Mm. Um, and I was really actually in the middle of that. I was, I read, I read thing or, a, and after I read, you know, it, it's like, it's not that you don't believe in God anymore. It's that you just can't imagine that experience. Mm. Um, you can't imagine believing in anything. Mm. Uh, I think talking about depression in that, in this way is dangerous because I don't, I mean, it, 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 it is a, it's a profoundly ex spiritual experience, but only after the fact, right? Or right. you can only, call, I mean, I would say, I don't That's think right. I would have started this show if I hadn't gone through my depression. Wow. Mm -hmm. I think the truth that I started telling about my life, I think that yes. the way that opened me to ask questions I hadn't asked before, um, mm -hmm. to open myself to experience in a way I hadn't before. This is so complicated to talk about, but I... I don't think I would have done anything I've done since wow. it. And so, mm -hmm. yeah, and it shattered, right? It, I, I was always about wanting to bring all of this down to earth and needing it to be real and embodied yes. and as messy as life actually is and as That's complicated right. as life actually is, but it really took me to another level with that. And that absolutely forms the questions I ask and the way I mm. ask and what I, what I look for in myself and what I look for in others. Mm. What a good answer. Thank you for sharing that. Um, I have one last question for you. And I ask all my guests this at the end of every show. This is a question I borrowed from Barbara Brown Taylor, who is one of my favorite people. <laughs> favorite leaders and thinkers. And you please, by all means, answer this however you want. And sometimes this can be an earnest answer and sometimes it can be absurd and we get it all and we love it all. So I know. <laughs> yes, yes. Yeah. Okay. So her questions, what's saving your life right now? Yeah. And I knew you were going to ask me, uh -huh. this. I started to, I, uh, what's saving my life right now? Um, here we are like right now, is a pretty intense now, right? Yes, it is. In my lifetime. It's an intense now. Um, my daughter, who's 28, um, has moved home with me for a little while. Yes. And at another stage in her development, mm -hmm. yes. <laughs> in mine, mm -hmm. this would have been quite stressful. Yes. Um, it, but here we are uh, after two years in which I, was, I led a pretty monastic solitary existence yeah. in my little house in Minnesota through lockdown. And it is an incredible joy to have this, mm -hmm. my, my, my daughter home and to be kind of, <laughs> you know how it is, uh, you know, this, the, the parenting adventure is yes. this, you just keep sure having, is. get to know them over and over, right? You totally, you, you know, them at two or at four or at six, mm. not, and it's the same thing at 28. And um, so, and I'm finding that it's having her here is um, really helping me heal from. Mm. Um, I love this. Just some of what I need to heal from, from the last couple of years. Hmm. So she's saving my life right now. I love this so much. My oldest, I think I mentioned he's almost 24. Yeah. And it's like a new human that I'm learning about the grown up version of him. And it's so delightful. It's just so wonderful. I highly recommend big kids, highly recommend. I, I, I wish somebody would have told me when they were two, like, just hang on. They turn 24. They have, they pay their own cell phone. You know, they, I've always found it, you know, people say to, I always say this to parents of young children, 
I mean, of course, young children are miraculous, right? They are, but people will say to you, oh, enjoy it while it lasts. Oh gosh. And I'm like, okay, fine. But something else comes after that. Oh, oh, I'm here for the teens. I've, I always knew I was going to be a teen mom. That was going to be my, that's going to be my zone where I finally start flourishing. (laughs) And it is true. I, I love them. I love their curiosity. I think they're so interesting. You kind of alluded to the next generation earlier, just saying their approach to faith is just wildly wonderful and they're smart and they're thoughtful and they're, they're so highly engaged in the well, world you know, and teenagers right now are practically a new species I'm telling you i mean who are these kids right i mean i was reading teen beat and these kids are like thinking existential thoughts about the world i just it is a new day with this generation and they're so impressive to me and you know there's a lot of ink spilled over oh we're gonna wring our hands over these kids. what are we gonna do with these kids i'm like we're gonna let them run the world hell like yeah. Let's pass the baton. They're, they, they're going to take it and they're going to run. I love that answer. And I'm tickled to know that you are delighting in your daughter. Who's now like a friend at 28. Yeah. That's yeah. a new dynamic yeah. um, in your own home in this lonely time of isolation. And um, I think that's wonderful. And I love that so much. I want to thank you times 1 million for coming on the show today and for sharing just your very elegant way of thinking and believing and existing with me and with my community. And I consider you a mentor and I have, I have followed your example and you've given me a lot of courage and you have instructed me just by way of modeling, um, what it looks like to live a beautiful faith that is good for all and, and loves the world and loves one another. And it doesn't take itself too seriously. And it, it holds its hands open. And you've just been a, a, one of the key leaders for me in my own personal evolution of faith. And so I want to thank you personally. And then I just want to thank you collectively for my community for serving us today. So um, keep going. Please, please say that you're not quitting. Are, do, do you have more gas in the tank, right? Like, okay. Yes. Okay, good. Oh God, please stop. Please never stop. And I'm glad you were in the world and I'm so thrilled to be walking alongside you. And I'm glad we've actually connected even though it's too. Muscles. Me too. I am always and 100% forever in your corner. And so any way I can ever like serve you or support you or your work, please. I want to be your first phone call. And I mean that. Okay. Thank you. Jen. Okay. Thank you, Krista. All right, you guys. Um, you can see why she's special. If you're new to Krista, that conversation is all the resume you need of hers. She is just thoughtful and so intelligent and so wonderfully curious and, and gentle and humble. I I'm just so drawn to her. I always have been, um, and I've learned so much from her. I'm grateful for her leadership in my life personally. Um, and I'm so happy for those of you who are new to her, for me to be introducing her to you today. Um, you will want to subscribe to her podcast. You will. Um, you can get it where all her podcasts are. I subscribe to maybe six podcasts and hers is one of them. And so she is just a phenomenal person and leader. Um, I love her work in the world. So if you go to jenhatmaker.com under the podcast tab, I'll have this entire episode, all the show notes, and then I will have links to everything Krista Tippett. So you can find all of her work there and find out where to follow her and how, and you will be so glad that you did. She is, we are better for her leadership in our lives. I love the series. I love these leaders. I love these thinkers. I love these divergent spaces. Um, If you've missed anything in the Faith Shakers series, go back and pick them up because we have really interviewed some of the most fascinating, interesting people leading in innovative ways. And I'm inspired. And you will be too. So if you haven't already, you guys subscribe to the show. That way you'll never miss a thing. You will never miss a thing. Um, And come back next week for more. Uh, What a lucky girl am I. My job is to interview people like Krista Tippett. I mean, please never stop listening. So I never have to stop having conversations with some of the best people on earth. All right, you guys. Love y'all. See you next week.